Fantastic. Welcome, everybody. Um, Okay, our numbers are leveling off a little bit. I'm going to start with some introductions and do a little bit of chatting while we get started and we have a few more people logging on. My name is Haley. Welcome. Um, I work for the Columbia Mountains Institute of Applied Ecology and that's CMI for short. And I join you here from Revelstoke, BC to present what is going to be the last talk in our fifth season of CRED Talks, the Columbia Region Ecological Discussions. Um, we're here today to hear from Robin, Dr. Robin Irvine, who is going to share some insights in her talk titled, What Can We See from Long-Term Data in the Columbia River? Patterns of Change Through a Rainbow Trout Lens. I wanna thank you for joining us today. We recognize that everyone is juggling a lot in life right now and always. So I just want to say that we appreciate your presence here today. Before we get started officially, and while people continue to log on, I can see we're up to about 58 people on the webinar. I'm just gonna take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about CMI for those of you who are not familiar. And for those of you who are familiar, I apologize if you've heard this feel many times. Uh, CMI is a nonprofit society and an association for people working in the various fields of ecology. Our home range is Southern British Columbia, Canada, but increasingly we see membership from across BC and into Alberta, the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. One of the main things we do is provide professional development opportunities such as conferences and courses. Some examples from the last few years include a recent workshop on forest fungi and their role in the ecosystem, a foundation level course of understanding statistics and decision-making for resource managers, taught by Robin's partner, in fact, Joe Thorley, an advanced field ornithology course, a variety of plant identification courses, critical habitat screening workshops, statistical methods courses, and a diversity of conferences that explore more complex topics like the ecology of regulated rivers or the incidental take of migratory birds or our current project, which is scaling up camera trap surveys to inform regional wildlife conservation. Our website is the best place to learn about the things we do and it has great resources such as preceding documents from all of our major events. And you can find these at cmiae.org. For this particular project, the CRED Talks, this is the first year that we've moved the speaker series online. So thank you COVID and welcome to everybody who's here as a result of this event going online. It's been really fun to see who signs up for these webinars. We used to host these in a little room in the community center in Revelstoke and we'd be happy if 20 people show up, but now we're getting a lot more people showing up from all over the place. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, and as a little practice of using your chat feature on Zoom, I'm wondering if you could hover your mouse down at the bottom of the screen, find that chat button, and then tell us who you are, what your affiliation is, and where you're from. I'm just going to, I see that my chat isn't turned on, so I'm going to put it on as well. All right. So I can see that we're getting a bunch of input here. That's fantastic. Heather, Taylor, Susan, Karen Bray, hello. Great, so while those are coming in, have a read through. It's really fun to see who's here. As is typical for our events, we've got a great mix of people on the line, a mix of academics, students, environmental consultants, industry representatives, teachers from various descriptions, um, of various descriptions, naturalists and government resource managers. Um, so I'm going to move on and I'm going to thank Columbia Basin Trust for their financial support of this series. Without this support and really as without the donations provided for many of you here today, this project wouldn't be possible. So thank you very much. If you hadn't had, haven't had time to donate, but you're able to, you can do that by the donate button on our website. We'd greatly appreciate that. And now before I get into the nitty gritty details, um, I just want to stop and I want to acknowledge and honor the four nations on whose traditional territory I broadcast from today in Revelstoke, and that is the Sinaiax, the Tanaha, the Sequapam, and the Silks. All right, so for some more nitty gritty details. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be paste, posted onto our website. The chat feature uh, on the side there will not show up on the recording, so you can rest assured there. All attendees have been muted for the session. The best way to communicate with us, the panelists, is through the chat feature. We'll have time for questions at the end, 
So to pose a question, simply put that into the chat and myself and another director who I'll introduce later will help to moderate the Q&A at the end. And now I get to introduce who you're here to actually listen to today, Robin Irvine, who's provided me with a very modest and graciously short bio. Robin Irvine is an ecologist who loves conservation and long-term data. She works for Parks Canada and she helps to run Poissel Consulting Limited, which is a quantitative consulting company based in Nelson, BC. Robin is joining us from Haraguay and it doesn't necessarily have the best internet. So she's gotten creative and she is joining us from her vehicle today. So I'm gonna pass it on to Robin. Thank you very much for that, Haley, and lovely to see everybody's names in the chat. Thanks for asking for that, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so uh, apologies for the background noise of cars. It's rush hour in Masset, BC on Haida Gwaii where I am uh, presenting from, uh, but the internet here is, is limited. Uh, so here I am. Uh, so the work I'll be speaking about today has been done on the Columbia and Kootenai rivers uh, and uh, we acknowledge our respect for and deep gratitude to the First Nations of that area that Haley acknowledged. I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded territory of the Haida people um, to whom I say Hawa for uh, the space to work on this land. Oh, there we go. It's coming up. Okay, so super. Thank you. Um, I also just really want to acknowledge my co-authors on this. This is, uh, and, and the people who are not listed as co-authors. Uh, this project has been going on for a very long time with a lot of people, a lot of fish technicians, a lot of knowledge. Um, and uh, the recent work is carried out um, by the Poisson Consulting Mountain Water Research and NEPCU partnership. Uh, but work has previously been done by lots of different folks. So next slide, please. So today I'm going to start with just a little uh, brief history of the Lower Columbia River where this work has been done, talk a little bit about uh, what the river came from and where it is now. And then I'm going to frame that using the focus of the species of, of rainbow trout um, and talk about some of the challenges that flow management invokes on that species. And then give you a few of the results that we have from this most recent work uh, that I've been doing with um, Jeremy Baxter, Joe Thorley, uh, and Mark Fideld uh, at the places I just mentioned, Nipku and Mountain Water Research. Next slide, please. Okay. So I think of the Columbia River um, as a bit of a neighbor as well as a neighborhood to us. Uh, it really does um, just dominate the area of this basin, which, uh, we, which most of us call home at one part of the year or the other. It's the largest river in North America that ends at the Pacific Ocean. And it's the only one, uh, it's only superseded in size by the St. Lawrence, the Mackenzie and the Mississippi. Um, it flows from the height of land by Invermere uh, and ends in Astoria, Oregon after 2000 kilometers of wide flowing fresh water. The swoops, the curves, the ravines we know from the river uh, from its present day and also from historical photographs were etched by the twin geologic forces of lava and glacial advance and retreat. And that glacial history also led to a very unique and diverse uh, fish fauna that was harvested by several different First Nation peoples on both sides of the present day US and Canada border. Prior to colonization of settler societies, the Columbia housed salmon and trout, whitefish and ciscos, sturgeon, many minnow species and sculpin species, and lamprey of multiple species as well that were used for their oil. Um, dip netting of salmon at the Dallas, uh, you can see the photo in the bottom left of this screen, um, was once one method of harvest and salmon fishing sites were, were the gathering sites of, of great importance for First Nations. The runs of salmon in the Columbia were over 16 million fish annually pre-colonization estimated. And then the salmon, that salmon founded a commercial fishery on um, the Columbia that had its heyday from 1880 till about 1930 with landed poundage of about 34 million pounds a year. Um, that went on until the 50s when the poundage dropped to 11 million pounds. They, they kept fishing and by the 1980s it was 1.2 million pounds per year. Uh, the salmon numbers um, in the areas that still have salmon uh, dipped to an all-time low of less than a million fish in the early 90s and the numbers have recovered a little bit since then. Next slide, please. 
So the fish fauna in the Columbia is quite diverse. Right now it's got about 61 native species and introduced species in the current day. So pictured here are three of the native species and one very large invasive northern pike held by Clint Tarala, who's one of the people who works on this project uh, with Jeremy. Um, and often we know and think of rainbow trout as, as invasive or introduced species, but not so here. Um, they're, they've been introduced around the world uh, as a popular angling fish, but in the Columbian Kootenai, they're a place where they're happily native. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the post-treaty Columbia River, um, prior to the sort of picture of the one that was uh, painted earlier by, you know, created by lava and glaciers, it's been developed and dammed for flood control, um, power generation and irrigation throughout its length. Although it's still a magnificent river, it has some pretty serious challenges uh, to mitigate the effects of many of the large and small dams along its length and within its tributaries. Uh, the dams were built in a time and, and with a mindset that wasn't necessarily geared to minimizing harm to the environment. Uh, so while these dams are, are now operated to reduce harm to fisheries and the river, and that's improved over time, there's still massive changes that the fish uh, fauna have to contend with. So the construction and development of the Columbia's main stem began in the 1930s uh, with the construction of Grand Coulee, which is pictured top left, and Bonneville dams um, by the US federal government. And Grand Coulee was the dam that, that blocked salmon from coming further upstream. Um, and in fact, today uh, it still has no fish, fish passage uh, associated with it. Uh, those losses impacted the cultural livelihood and um, the spiritual aspects of First Nations life, as well as uh, settlers, and profoundly changed the nutrient regime and structure of the whole ecosystem. The treaty negotiated in 1961 required Canada to build three dams for flood control, <clears throat> one of which I'll be talking about quite a bit today, uh, Duncan, Hugh Keenly Side by Castlegar and Micah. I'll be talking a lot about Hugh Keenly Side. In exchange for providing and operating the Columbia River Treaty Dams, Canada received payments, <clears throat> excuse me, for future flood control benefits. Uh, but it's important to note that at that time, First Nations had no part in the initial treaty negotiations and uh, evaluations of the compensation that was actually uh, given to Canada has been strongly criticized um, by both uh, First Nations and non-First Nations folks for the low value placed on the loss of salmon. In 2019, a little ray of hope has uh, emerged um, over after many long years of struggle. Uh, a historic agreement was signed with the government of Canada, government of BC, uh, and three nations to restore salmon to the upper Columbia basin and work is underway to look at the risks, benefits and how to do this. Next slide, please. So that's the stage. Uh, let's get to the star of the show. Um, rainbow trout. These guys are some of the cutest carnivores I know. They feed on the rich insect hatches of the Columbia River. So you can see some caddis in the bottom center there. The insect hatch hatches are fairly well known by locals. They're known as Night of the Living Caddis by some people. Uh, River Moth Madness is another name I've heard. <laughs> um, and they are profound uh, production for the fish to feed on. Um, rainbow trout are a highly diverse species throughout the basin uh, with respect to habitat and life histories. Uh, five ecotypes are still found in the basin. Um, and arguably since salmon's loss in this area, it, the most important fish uh, in terms of its recreational and food use. So they require throughout their life, cool water that's well oxygenated, um, spawning gravels and water over their nests or reds uh, until they hatch, shallow and warm rearing habitat for the young fish and an abundance of insect life. The development of the dams within the basin uh, resulted in a reduction in genetic and life history diversity for rainbow trout. Uh, the yellowfin ecotype was lost um, and there was loss of flowing habitat through inundation as well as spawning habitat due to fluctuating water levels. So the focus of the rest of this talk uh, is on the development of understanding of some of these potential impacts and how to mitigate them with a focus on red dewatering and the impact of flow on the recruitment and abundance of rainbow trout. Next slide, please. So first I'm gonna take a little sideways step. Um, you know, as it said in my intro, I kind of have a love of long-term data. And the question is why? <laughs> why would you have a love of long-term data? Um, <clears throat> so I love it because it's valuable and it's interesting. 
uh, and it's interesting for very specific reasons. Um, it provides data at scales that are relevant to management. So if you think about obtaining information from a variety of years, um, you, you encompass the full range of years. So this past year, for example, very interesting um, because of patterns of human use changed radically with COVID. Uh, but also think about precipitation. There's wet years, there's dry years, there's average years, and there's strange years. Um, and if you have long-term data, you actually get to cover the full range of those. It allows the research team to identify unique opportunities. Uh, for example, you'll see uh, a picture later in this uh, presentation from a drone where there was an exceptionally clear water year. Uh, so if you are studying for just one year, you might happen on that one year, but you might not. Uh, sufficient data and the variation it provides gives us as ecologists the chance to develop and test predictive models to help with understanding the mechanisms behind what we're seeing in the patterns. Otherwise, we are literally just drawing pretty pictures with dots. The long-term data matches the time scale of the data to the processes of the organism. So rainbow trout, for example, have a generation time of about five years. So now, after over 20 years of study, we are getting into just four generations of time, right? So it's important to consider those and, you know, for large carnivores and, and things like sturgeon, much, much longer. <clears throat> Long-term data also provides spin-off questions and collaborations to develop. This kind of seems like a bit of a throwaway point, but as I said at the beginning, it, you know, this, this project has been passed on and passed on and, and shared and, and grown through different people's participation. And uh, all projects can have many iterations and continue beyond the, the owner at the time's understanding and knowledge. And that's actually quite beautiful to me. Um, we don't talk about beauty in science, except when we're sort of exercising our naturalist selves. Um, but this is one area of beauty in long-term studies that I see that it's, uh, it's, it's intergenerational like the data. Next slide. So just to orient us a little further, um, you might have to blow this up on your monitor of choice to see the print on the map. Um, but the main goal of this long-term research project uh, in the past, from the 1990s to 2017, was to assess flow impacts on rainbow trout populations during um, the spawning period to see how it impacted their abundance, uh, how many fish are in the system, their distribution, where are they spawning in the system, and their spawning success, how many of those nests remain underwater long enough to actually produce fry. So prior to 1992, Hugh Keenly Side Dam, which is pictured in the top left of this map and is just outside of Castlegar um, and is operated by BC Hydro, is um, used to typically decrease their flows from March to May. Um, that resulted in rainbow trout reds potentially getting dewatered, depending on the year. So in 1992, after consultation with regulatory agencies, Hydro agreed to alter their flows to keep river levels stable or increasing from April 1st to June 30th. And these are what are known as the rainbow trout spawning protection flows, which I might refer to in various ways as protection flows or spawning protection flows. Um, so Hugh Keenly side is one dam that influences the Columbia and Kootenai rivers. Uh, the other is noted in the top right of the slide, Brilliant Dam, which is operated by Fortis. Um, the flows from Brilliant obviously would impact the Columbia downstream and do, but it also has a backwatering effect on one of the most important spawning areas, Norn's Fan. So just to say that the flows experienced by rainbow trout involves multiple dams, multiple parties, and multiple coordination points. So it, it makes it challenging to do a whole system experiment and perturbation that I'm going to talk about. So after that study program I spoke about uh, ended in 2017, uh, what did we know? We knew that rainbow abundance had gone up, uh, that distribution in the system had increased, so more spawning areas were being used, uh, but we had little idea of the causation or if it was linked to the spawning flows. And the reason for that is that there had been <laughs> Sorry, a tractor just went by. Um, since there had been no significant variation in those flows since 1993, so there was there was really nothing to test against. There was nothing um, to determine whether it was caused by that. Uh, next slide, please. So in order to test the impacts of the flows, uh, an experimental program was initiated in, in 2018 uh, with planned years where a proportion of reds would be allowed to be dewatered to determine if there was any impact on the number of H1 rainbow trout showing up in the following year on the indexing program, uh, which is a separate research program. Um, 
the main methods we used uh, we use continually are the enumeration of of reds uh, from the air and from the boat, so from a helicopter, and then determining when a flow change will isolate reds, and then following up with staged excavations and noting all of the variables. Um, air temperature, solar radiation, stage height, uh, temperature in the gravels, and then analyzing the data. In time, uh, we hope to refine the understanding of the mechanisms behind egg and alevin mortality. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit of the preliminary results today. So the plan was to turn off the spawning protection flows in 2019, 2021, and 2023. Uh, but because of flow management issues, we couldn't actually drop the flows in 2019 uh, to the levels required to uh, strand the reds that we wanted to strand. So only 0.7% of the total reds in the system in 2019 were dewatered. That's about average for a year when the protection flows are in place. Um, it's not simple to do a whole system experiment. I guess that's the real punchline there when other things like power generation, flood control, and reservoir capacity are, uh, are still concerns. And next slide, please. So this image uh, zooms us into the area just above the Lower Kootenai River confluence with the Columbia, where you can see Norn's fan delineated in orange on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, this is the most important spawning area uh, identified over the course of this program. Um, and then you can see some smaller spawning areas delineated in orange uh, further downstream on the right upstream bank, which is what RUB stands for. Um, when the fish are spawning, as you'll see on a, a later image, uh, they leave a large elliptical area of clean gravels behind that can be distinguished from above. Uh, it takes a skilled observer to understand what they're seeing, um, but the folks who are doing this have been doing it for many years. Um, and we have very consistent data collection, which is super helpful. Next slide, please. So um, these are tiny, but I'm just looking for you to sort of see patterns here. So what we have in the top row is the 1980s discharge from HLK Dam. And what you can see on the left-hand side of each panel is a, a, a fairly substantive decrease, generally speaking, uh, from sort of January until April, May. Um, then in 1993, which is the third panel in the second row down, uh, you start to see a radical change after it was negotiated for the spawning protection flows to start. So what you see is like a little, I don't think you guys see my cursor, do you? No, okay. So you'll see a little drop on the far left. That's kind of the drop right when the, the flows start, uh, the protection flows start. Um, on April 1st, and then it'll be steady pretty much until June 30th, and then you'll see fluctuations later in the year. So you can see there's just, just not that much um, variety. There's certainly differences in the years, but most of the differences you see in the years are um, later in the year, in the summer and fall months. Next slide, please. So what might be the impacts of no flow protection? Um, Flow protection is obviously effective uh, from what we've seen in this, in, uh, what I'll explain in this plot. Um, let me just orient you here. So this is a, this is a preliminary model. I, I do need to say that on behalf of my lovely partner, Joe. Um, and uh, some of it's based on quite a bit of data and some of it's based on not that much data. So in the left-hand panel, the one labeled historical, we have uh, egg and alevin mortality by percent on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis we have without spawning protection flows or with spawning protection flows. So in the left-hand panel for historical, what we have for without spawning protection flows is data from 1991 and 92. Uh, centered around roughly 45 to 50%. Now this is based on very little data, but this was from Norns Creek Fan and is empirical data that is then modeled with some uncertainty based on those two estimates. Um, the right hand violin, um, and violins are kind of intuitive, uh, but let me just explain them. So a longer skinnier top to a violin plot tells you that there's more outliers and the spread of the data sort of dribbles off into, into the top end. Um, this right-hand violin in the historical plot, you can see has very wide, chunky uh, bellows at, a, at the bottom, right around 5%. That tells you where most of the data is humped. That, that's where most of the egg and alevin mortality sat for uh, flow protection data. So what we're seeing is that although the flow protection data for egg mortality can range as high as 27%, we never actually saw that 
So that's just the model saying it could go that high, but most of the data really sits here. The forecast based on a predictive model um, from the work that we've done over the past couple of years looking at the egg mortality, which I'll get to in a second, shows us that it's very unlikely that there's much difference between the uh, red, sorry, the egg mortality with or without flows. Next slide, please. And I'll get back to that because I know that's a bit confusing in that orientation, but it made sense at the time I made this. <laughs> so we're looking at the abundance of rainbow here. And I just wanted to sort of talk about um, what we've seen. Uh, the reason the egg numbers and mortality are, are being assessed in this experimental way uh, is due to the other monitoring programs noting decreased rainbow size and condition. So the, the fatness and healthiness of the fish. So this change in condition um, led the technical committee to implement and assess this experimental flow protocol. And, and what we're seeing here is, is a classic ecological relationship where, you know, if you have a few fish in a system, they tend to be relatively large. And if you have a lot of fish and they're past a carrying capacity, they tend to be smaller. And so that isn't necessarily being borne out by anglers experiences. Um, it's hard to say uh, because that's very subjective and certainly experienced anglers will shift their patterns with fish patterns, but we are seeing it in the indexing program. Next slide, please. So this is um, an orientation of where we're seeing the most spawning in the system. Um, and so there's two main places. So Norns Fan and Janelle. So Norns Fan is that area that we saw earlier on the map. It's just above the confluence with the lower Columbia River. So that's in that first panel. You can see the hump at uh, 0.5, that would be Norns Fan. Uh, sorry, that's the LKR. Uh, LCR above LKR is at eight kilometers. We've got Norns Fan. Um, and then Janelle is at kilometer 25 on the right hand side of the panel. So because we have these dominant sites that make up, you know, more than 25 to 30 percent of the eggs, it's pretty critical that um, those areas are successful. And these areas are uh, very diverse in their bathymetry, but they also have certain characteristics that are common, which is that they have quite a bit of shallow water over gravel habitat. Um, that the little fish and ailments like to rear in. So they're also vulnerable to dewatering. Next slide, please. Um, this is a close up of a drone shot from over Norn's fan. Uh, and you can see that the black dots are scaled to the number of reds found in this area. Um, we were really blessed this past year with really clear water uh, and no wind on a day when um, Harrier surveys from Nelson was able to fly for us. And so we were able to see some reds that we'd never seen before. Uh, so some of those deep water reds in the sort of dark blue um, bathymetry line, ISO line are, um, were ones we suspected were there, but we could never see. Um, so, this goes back to that importance of long-term data and also gives you some idea of the complexity of the habitat that these fish are in and how challenging it is um, to, uh, to manage for different flow conditions because of this large sort of, uh, you know, the lighter uh, top center of the slide where you have very shallow water. Next slide, please, Haley. So this ties back to the violin plot. This is our, our egg mortality. So we were working on the assumption as biologists uh, that whenever you dropped water um, and the reds were exposed, that the eggs died. It seemed logical. Uh, it made a lot of sense. Um, they need water to rear. That's not been our finding, which is so interesting. So egg mortality assessed in dewatered reds uh, from 2019, you can see in the left-hand panel, did vary between zero and 100%. We had some reds where 100% of them died, as you would expect, uh, but it was typically below 25% uh, for days, like for more than a week, uh, super interesting. So the groundwater was still kind of welling up, keeping them cool, keeping them wet, keeping them oxygenated enough, and, and they were not dying. So this is a super important model for, for us to, to reframe what we're thinking about when it comes to, to egg mortality. Uh, and in 2020, um, you know, to be honest, I, I don't know exactly the situation there. If Jeremy's on the call, I'll ask him about that. But um, the main results we have this year are for, are for this um, 
metric are from 2019, where we excavated the reds uh, sequentially over time to make sure that the eggs were still alive and then staged uh, the eggs to make them to see where they were at and when they died. So even though we didn't get the optimum dewatering, we did get some important information that we're hoping to flesh out uh, over the next few years. Next slide. So this is my one little quick walkthrough of long-term data through the rainbow trout lens. Um, what do we learn in a sort of more general sense? Uh, abundance of rainbow trout is super high in this section of river. It's unknown how much is due to protection flows. We certainly hope to elucidate that further uh, with some more experiments. Um, understanding what the rainbow need with respect to flow could allow other ecological factors to be optimized in future. There's a, there's a cost to all of these kinds of protection flows in that that water can't be used for something else like heron nests or I'm not sure, other things. But um, data suggests at least twice as many eggs are re as required to reach carrying capacity are currently in the system. So there is some room to play, which is why we feel safe doing these experiments. And we're starting to see indications that rainbow trout growth and condition are slightly suppressed. The other thing we learned is that some impacts of dams, uh, we thought were in one direction, were in a completely another. Uh, for example, we found over the many years of the water licensing requirements study that there was a strong and resilient positive correlation between the number of age one rainbow trout recruits estimated by the indexing program and the percentage of dewatered reds in the previous year. So this suggests that when conditions that result in more red dewatering um, happened, they are actually positively correlated with higher survival for some reason, which is somewhat counterintuitive. Eggs in our first preliminary study, and I say this with preliminary, preliminary, preliminary in front of it, uh, are surprisingly resilient to the dewatering and really interested to see if that holds up over multiple years of excavations. And the last thing is with this uh, study, I just want to say that it's just an amazing baseline that's been created by many scientists over many years with whom I'm honored to work um, to watch implications of changes. You know, uh, if salmon return in my lifetime, you know, how does that impact these fish? These, these guys have, have been, you know, a medium sized dog in the river for a long time. It would be very, very different. Uh, and also it gives us a baseline against which to track uh, changes that result from more extreme weather events and other implications of climate change in the basin. Anyway, with that, I'm happy to have a discussion or um, answer questions from the chat if any pop up. And uh, thank you, Haley and Brendan for hosting me today. Thanks, Robin. That was really great. Um, I did just so you know, have a quick search in the attendees to see if it's Jeremy Baxter. Is that who you were thinking of that might be able to answer a question? <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't think he's here. Was another <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> That's fine. It's okay. Which, I just that Jeremy, if you wonder why I, you received a request to turn your mic on, that was why, but you can ignore that. Um, so right now we can, we can flow into questions. If anyone has any questions, just type that into your chat um, and we'll relay that to Robin. Um, in the background with me here, I have Brendan Wilson. He's long time CMI board member, CMI vice president at the moment and chair of um, the environment and, environment and geomatics at Selkirk College. So if he pipes in to help direct me in the Q&A, um, don't be surprised, he's back here too. I don't see any questions popping up at the moment. Here we go. We've got one from Elka Wind. Is it possible that the eggs are certain? Oh, it's gone. See, this is, hold on one moment. <laughs> I can come. see it. I can see it actually, Haley. Yeah. Um, yeah so we are don't they know. surviving because of the jelly layer? Just say that so everybody else can hear it. Yeah. So um, maybe. <laughs> Short answer is maybe. Um, so some of the reds that we excavated very clearly, uh, you know, were, were still being influenced by groundwater. You could see that from the temperature of the loggers we had buried in the reds. Uh, you could also just feel it as you dug down, you know, the coolness, the wetness, it just increased. Um, so there's probably a number of things. So uh, this project is carrying on for probably an additional two years and we're hopeful that we might be able to get a little more discernment.
You just want me to keep going through the chat because I can see them, Haley. Can you see them? Okay, sure, if you want to. Um, Kathy Eichenberger said, has improvement of water quality over the last three decades been a contributor to the increase in population? That's a great question to which I do not have a great answer. Um, I know that uh, folks from Kelowna uh, Ecoscape Consulting has worked on the water quality and nutrient um, regime in the lower Columbia River, um, but it's been relatively short term, more water licensing requirement timeline, so 10 to 12 years. So I'm not sure if there's anyone who's been on the Columbia River longer on the line, I'm happy to defer. Has there been studies on egg predation? Um, there's been lots of anecdotal uh, egg predation work. Uh, so uh, sturgeon <laughs> love rainbow <tr> eggs. <laughs> they just uh, float over Norn's fan and hoover them up with their little protrusible mouths. It's, yeah, it's, it's quite something. Um, but as far as I know, there's been no study on the impact of egg predation on the uh, recruitment to the population, if that's what you're inferring. Are you seeing any red superimposition, Dylan Glazer or Glasser? Um, yes, yes, we are. Um, generally speaking, you can still tell uh, to sort of an order of magnitude how many are being superimposed. So the first one's really easy to see because uh, of the, the scraping off of that dark periphyton that's on the rocks in the Columbia it becomes quite light. Um, then it sort of expands out, but the size of the spawners um, and the size of their reds uh, is, is relatively similar. Um, obviously, first year spawners who are smaller do little smaller ones, but like they do, uh, you can kind of say, okay, that would be like five um, and make an estimate. Uh, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Kevin Rossi, do you think better survivorship being correlated with red dewatering is due to lack of rearing habitat for fry or high competition? Yeah, so we, we talked about this quite a bit in our 2018 report, Kevin, um, which might give you a more fulsome answer than I can give you here, if you'd like that. Um, you can always email me. Um, but one of the things that we thought it might be is that it actually got us to a stage in the river that might have been um, better for rearing habitat and, and less competition. So there's a very old, very famous book about uh, trout competition, um, where you end up with bigger fry when you have less fry in the system. Um, so it could be either one of those things. Can this dewatering finding extend to shore spawners in Kootenai Lake, Greg Utzig? Uh, I wouldn't say so, Greg. Super different system, different species, in fact. Um, oh, if you're talking about kokanee, I'm not sure if you're talking about the shore spawning rainbow. Um, yeah, I don't know the groundwater and the hydrological uh, sort of encounters was different between reds. So I wouldn't want to extrapolate to a different system like Kootenai Lake. Um, Luke Turcott, these are very interesting results. Do you think flow ramping could cause larger mortalities at a later life stage? I'm thinking of stranding of the emergent fry and young of the year. Yeah, there's been a ton of work done on stranding by uh, Golder Associates, Okanagan Nation Alliance, uh, as well as myself uh, and my partner, Joe Thorley at Poisson Consulting. So um, what can I say? I can point you to a river research and applications uh, paper that we published on stranding in the Columbia River that was based on 12 years of data uh, that might help answer that question. It does uh, cause mortality. Um, the level of mortality whole river is difficult to extrapolate because of the high variation amongst sites. So uh, Janelle, for example, with that low gradient, shallow water, warm water, uh, fry love to rear in there and they unfortunately get stranded in there. When they do an exclusion fencing around that, as they've done a few times, when they know a drop is coming for various reasons, it's very effective. Um, but then there's potentially knock-on costs of uh, losing that rearing habitat. If any of these are not answering your questions, feel free to <laughs> revamp them in the chat. <laughs> um, what is red superimposition? Uh, oh yeah, red superimposition is really interesting. It's when uh, one fish does the work of moving the big gravels and does their red, and then another fish comes on top and puts their eggs on top, but they might destroy some of the earlier eggs. Um, it's very common in uh, Atlantic salmon streams, um, and sometimes the, the uh, later ones do better than the earlier ones, and sometimes the earlier ones do better than the later ones, and there's various papers on it. Uh, is there a way to view the reds around the confluence without disturbing the spawning fish? Yeah, great question. You know, 
I There's think... a couple of places. That, there you go. Go, Brandon. That, uh, that, that Raina and, and Pierre um, Yvonne can, can give you a heads up on. Um, there's a, there's a few places like just below the, the, um, the brilliant bridge, you can stand on the, on the cliffs above there and look down and see the, the rainbow on some reds there. And there's, there's some other places. So, so ask, ask Raina and Pierre about the secret spots where you could go. I've Thanks given Raina the permission to talk so she can unmute herself <laughs> and respond to that now if she wants to. Sorry, I missed I missed a lot of that. I had some some other people in the background, but um, <laughs> uh, and I and I don't know what's going on. But um, yeah, that place that Brennan just mentioned that's below it's on the big bedrock outcrop below the um, brilliant bridge is fantastic place to watch some of the really large rainbow spawn. They come in quite early and it's quite clear there. Um, bring your polarized glasses. And um, if you sit up there quietly, I always take classes there. And I think Pierre takes his students there now too. And um, yeah, it's a great spot. And you can also see sturgeon in there often too, because yeah, they're coming in to hoover up the, the eggs. Yeah, thanks for that, Raina. Um, I see you have a question here. Do you think the recontouring of the fan gravel bars in early 2000s reduced dewatering or moved the spawning? I don't know. Um, the stranding work that I did when I was working for Golder and Kesselgar certainly indicated that uh, it had dropped um, the stranding rates uh, on those. Um, I don't know whether it helped with the dewatering um, or if it moved the spawning. Um, the thing with the, the abundance of the fish in the system right now is they're basically using everywhere they can because there's so many of them. Uh, so potentially if the fish numbers uh, drop a bit through management or predation or other mechanisms, um, some of those areas that are less optimal will start to get selected out again. Um, but I don't actually know the answer to either of those. And then Sam uh, Johnstone asked, are steelhead included in the Pacific salmon reestablishment plan proposal? Great question. Also don't know the answer to that one. I hope so. Yeah, I don't know. That was a bit That's of a great. lightning round. Anyone else? <laughs> that was a lightning round. You did well, fast and on it. Um, and we don't, we're not even needed. So that's great. I think that probably concludes the, um, the Q&A. We have a comment that says good stuff and I, I can't agree more. Um, I'm just going to change the slide here and maybe conclude by thanking you very much. Let me just see. Great to see the results. Okay, there is one more question. Do you want to nab that one? Sure. Sarah Arnold asked, great to see results from long-term data. Do you have any recommendations for how to develop these kinds of long-term data sets, given that funding and research priorities tend to be changeable in short term? Yes, it's like I planted this question. So my um, PhD supervisor, Elizabeth Crone, said to me when I was in my PhD, she was like, just go start counting something. Just doesn't matter what. <laughs> something you like, something you want to count every year and just start, like, just do it. Um, so there, are, there can be really simple things that as ecologists or naturalists or people interested in the world <laughs> that you can, you can do. Um, and that can be um, the germ or the seed for, uh, for a pilot study later on with, with one of the funding agencies in our region. Um, other than that, I would say, uh, you know, with regards to changeable uh, research priorities, uh, I've always been very interested in applied questions. I, I think if you think about what's coming um, and how questions are going to be asked, sometimes you can align correctly and sometimes you just don't get it right and you lose the funding. So it's, um, or things change in a way that you don't expect. I mean, had I known COVID was coming, I would have had cameras all over Parks Canada monitoring the wildlife behaviors. But, uh, you know, we didn't. So there you go. Um Martin Carver, do we ideally need higher spawning protection flows or what, or is what we are able to do enough under the present rules that may constrain those flows? I don't know if I understand that. Um, so Martin, um, currently what we're doing is we're testing the existing flows to see if uh, they need to be maintained or if they can be altered. I don't think we need higher ones because we're seeing that with the protection flows we currently have in place in the years when they're doing them right now, um, we're getting extremely low red dewatering. And, and to be fair as well, 
we don't actually know what the natural dewatering rate would have been on the Columbia River. It would have had peaky flow. So there would have been some reds that would have been dewatered naturally. And we, we assume that it would have been zero naturally because we don't have better information to inform that, but it probably wasn't zero. Um, but yeah, so the spotting protection flows right now are, are, are doing a great job. It's just a question of what we're losing as a result of um, keeping them in place. So that's why we're experimenting. And also because there's a lot of rainbow in the river and that may not actually be um, that optimal for the river. I don't know if that answers that. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, great answer, he says. <laughs> we'll leave All right, it we'll wrap up. Um, I, thank you everybody for coming once again. Thank you, Columbia Basin Trust for your support. Thank you very much to everyone who donated um, to this series. That'll help us to ensure that we are able to get the next series up and off the ground. If you have any ideas for speakers you'd like to see, um, send me an email. We love to hear those suggestions from you. If you have some work you want to share, let me know. Um, have a great day, everyone. Thanks a bunch. <laughs>